Well, sometimes a sermon begins with a controversial statement. Uh, Today it doesn't. Uh, Some people like camping. Uh, Some people even love camping. And I'm not one of them. Uh, I've got lots of fond memories of going camping as a kid, uh, setting up tent in the backyard or at a campsite by the beach. Just as many memories of lying on rocks, getting smoke in my face and mouth and some very friendly mosquitoes. But I have to admit, maybe camping isn't so bad all the time. It's not too bad for a night or two. I I can put up with it. And it gives you opportunities to go and stay places you wouldn't stay otherwise. But would anyone rather live in a tent than in a house? Like forever, like for the rest of your life, would you choose to live under canvas? There might be one or two very keen campers who would. I wonder, though, whether after the second or third or fourth decade it would start to get a bit, a bit tired. Uh, the, the tent eventually, the, the ropes start to loosen, the canvas sags, and you can't keep the weather out all the time. Well, you, you may remember back in 1993 when Paul Keating was the Prime Minister, he said, if you're not living in Sydney, you're just camping out. Well, God's message today is a little bit like that too. If you're not in heaven, you're just camping out. And here in 2 Corinthians chapters 4 and 5, God tells us that our present physical bodies are just temporary. Like the tent you spend a week in, a week or a weekend in every few months. Our present bodies are temporary. But in heaven we will have permanent bodies that we can, so that we can live with him forever. And for a moment that might seem nice, but probably not very important. But if we think about it for very long, we see that that, that message actually challenges the way we think. To realise that the bodies we have now are not all that we will have in heaven. Perhaps we don't think about heaven very much at all unless we get one of those terrible test results and have to go off for a round of of investigations. I suspect that for many of us, even as Christians, we invest far more time in our thinking and in our doing in the material things of this life that in the end will not last. It's materialism. It's the world we live in, it's the air we breathe, and its roots go down deep, even into many Christian hearts. Now, if we've thought about what God says to us here for very long, that our present bodies are temporary, and in heaven we will have permanent, glorious spiritual bodies... Uh, we might come to the conclusion that God only cares about spiritual things and that all the time we spend not reading our Bibles, not praying, not going to church, not doing spiritual stuff actually doesn't matter to God at all. And so there's really only one opportunity to make the most out of life because none of the good stuff the world wants is going to be in heaven. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die as we read in 1 Corinthians 15. If we think that, we've fallen for what's called dualism, the idea that the body and the spirit are opposites, uh, that physical things are always bad, there'll be no space for them in heaven, and that spiritual things are always good, and so death means leaving the body behind. Well, the problem with materialism and dualism is this. They don't match the world that God made for us. Uh, Here, Paul tells us that God made us to live our spiritual lives now for his glory. And he made us to live with him forever. Uh, Our lives here on earth and in heaven will be completely different if we actually believe that. So first of all, let's think about our lives here on earth. Because heaven is real, how should we live differently here on earth? And that's what we see in verses 13 to 18 of chapter 4. 
Uh, And we see that because we will have renewed spiritual and physical bodies in heaven, we can face weakness here confidently. We can face weakness confidently. I mentioned that we went camping quite a bit when I was a kid and I was actually chatting with my brother-in-law last weekend. He has in his backyard the, uh, the camper trailer that my parents used to take us in when I was young. And it's still got two wheels and many of the familiar things on it. But, uh, but Ray was telling me it's not what it once was. Uh, the canvas is worn through on the roof and you can see daylight through it. Uh, no doubt it'll let in a bit of water. And the, the main zipper on the front door, it'll shut some of the time. But you can never tell which time that will be. And I mention that because it's that very kind of picture Paul uses here for us, isn't it? He says uh, that uh, our physical bodies, in verse 16, our physical bodies wear out. Am I going to have to spend much time convincing us of that? The younger people might not believe it, but... Uh, Believe me, the people sitting around you and standing in front of you were young once as well. And what's happened to them will happen to you too if you stick around long enough. I'm sure most of us didn't expect it to be this way, but it is. And yet God tells us in the face of the physical weakness that we feel, we can have confidence. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart in the face of all this. But lots of people do, don't they? They Often we'll say, well, at least you've got your health. But what if you don't? But what do you do when the strength and energy you used to have are gone? The tasks that you have to do just to stay alive and fed and clothed and in your own home, when that just fills the week and there's no longer any time for anything else. How do you feel about that? Do you lose heart sometimes when there are more doctor's appointments on the calendar than appointments to meet up with friends or family? If that's your life now, or one day it will be, God says this, do not lose heart. And he tells us why. Because in verse 14, we're told, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. So you and I can both be confident that despite our physical weakness, Because of what God has done in the past, raising Jesus from the dead, the weaknesses of this life will not get the last word. God will raise us too in the very same way as it says here and also in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, We can be confident because of the past, but we can also be confident now in the present because of what we experience here. As verse 16 says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly, it's a different story, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. If you're wasting away on the outside, what's going on inside? Time changes everyone, doesn't it? And not always for the better. There are people who say that they're Christians who go through the years getting more and more bitter. Everything is an inconvenience and they'll happily tell you about it. Inside, they're growing old and rotting away day by day. But that's not what God calls Christians to be, is it? No, he says that he gives us grace in verse 15. That all that happens is for our benefit, including the grace that he gives us, so that his good message will reach others and that he would be glorified 
as people give thanks. If we are connected to to Jesus, as Colin reminded us last Sunday from John 15, if we have deep and abiding faith in him, then we draw our life from him and we will be strengthened and renewed inside even when the body gets worse and worse on the outside. And I didn't put this in my notes, but it's one of the great joys of being a part of this congregation to see those of you who perhaps your bodies are wearing out more than you would want. And yet there is a growing joy and faith and expectancy on the inside. Keep at it. Don't lose heart. It's a great encouragement to the rest of us. Well, how does that happen? It won't just happen because time passes, will it? There are people for whom the passing of time makes them worse. We can only be renewed inwardly when we draw near to God in prayer and in joyful wholehearted obedience to his word as we hear it and read it and study it together and by ourselves. And that's exactly what Colin was encouraging us to do last Sunday. You know, there were some Christian researchers in the last few years from the Centre for Biblical Engagement, and they wanted to find out the one indicator of a person who will grow spiritually over their lifetime. And it wasn't that their parents were Christians and it wasn't that they went to Sunday school or youth camps and it wasn't that they went and did a ministry traineeship or went to Bible college. It was that they read the Bible at least four times a week. It's as simple as that, that we spend time in God's word, even if it's just a little bit, and apply it to our lives. If we're doing that, we know that we're connected to the vine. We know that we're drawing our life from Christ as he confronts and changes and renews us on the inside. So is that what's going on in your life? Uh, Can you say with Paul, outwardly, well, don't ask, but inwardly, I'm being renewed day by day. But maybe you're thinking, well, you don't understand, Stephen. It's easy for you. You get to sit in your study all week. But for us out here in the real world, life is hard. Well, I know. I live in the real world as well. Life is hard. Our relationships break down. People we love die. We don't know always what to do. And we suffer. But notice how Paul describes all of that just in the first couple of verses, uh, words of verse 17. He describes all of the suffering of this life as our light and momentary troubles. Now, this is Paul who knew what real life was. Paul who was beaten repeatedly. Paul shipwrecked three times, stoned and left for dead and eventually gave his life for Christ, uh, likely on the command of the Roman emperor himself. Uh, How could he say that our suffering here is light and momentary? Well, he's showing us that our suffering is temporary. It will be replaced. Uh, Our light and momentary troubles actually achieve something in verse 17. They achieve for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. John Piper is very helpful on this point. He says that when Paul is hurting, he fixes his eyes not on how heavy the hurt is, but on how heavy the glory will be because of the hurt. I don't know about you, but it seems that God wants my eternity to be much more glorious than I feel that it needs to be. And yet that's his good plan for us. It works because suffering produces perseverance and character and hope as we read in Romans chapter 5. 
And that is what lasts, isn't it? Paul contrasts here what's temporary and what endures in verse 18. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, on our sufferings and the things of this life, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Isn't that at the very heart of our problems? We prefer what we can see over what we can't see. If I gave you the choice, I can check in my wallet and give you $50 now or a note saying that I'll give you $500 in a month. Which one would you go for? There's not even $50 in my wallet now, so that might give you an indication of which one to choose. But we so often focus on what we can have right now and we will sell what we could have down the stream. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. But if if we're not being inwardly renewed day by day, it's probably because we're putting what we can see first. It demands our attention, doesn't it? It's right there in front of us. So why should we value the unseen things? Well, what we see is temporary. Houses, land, toys, businesses, they're all going to be gone one day. Even if you hand them on to your kids and grandkids and they go on for generations, they will one day come to an end. But the unseen is eternal. Faith is unseen. Hope is unseen and and love is unseen too. And, And Paul tells us that love is the thing that endures. Uh, Worship will continue eternally. Uh, Our good works have a bearing on our eternity uh, and godly character will exist in our eternal life in heaven as well. It's all part of the eternal glory we'll have in heaven when we will be like Jesus in a way that we can't fully be now. So doesn't it make sense to invest our effort and time and resources into what lasts and to want to hand that on rather than the physical things of this life? Now, of course, we are meant to use the physical things of this life now for God's glory. So don't be discouraged. But even though your body might be wasting away, God's plan is to renew you day by day on the inside. Don't fix your attention on the temporary things, but on the unseen and eternal things. That's the way the eternal Christian hope changes today, isn't it? It makes us ask, well, what should I set my eyes on? What are those unseen things that demand my attention? And what can I look forward to? That's the big question Paul goes on to in chapter 5. What should I look forward to? If I'm to give up all of the pleasures and joys that people say I can have here in this life, well, what is going to outweigh that in the life to come? Well, God tells us in chapter 5, and particularly in verse 5, that he has made some people... To live with him forever. Uh, If all that we look at is what we can see, uh, we might easily conclude the broken world around us is all that there is. But God says, no, there is something unseen. There is an eternal home. Verse 1 says, an eternal house in heaven, not built with human hands. That God has made for all who repent and believe in him. Uh, In fact, not only has he made that home for us, he made us for that home, as verse 5 says. The one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God. Knowing God's plan will help you and me to face death and the future without fear. Of course, we'd fear death if we don't know what comes after it. 
if we don't know what to expect out of it. But if we've acknowledged our sins, turned from them to trust in the Lord Jesus for forgiveness, we can be sure your present body is temporary, but God has a building for believers that is eternal. The fact is, we have to wait for it, though, don't we? Uh, Like a a kid waiting for Christmas. And what do kids waiting for Christmas do? Uh, Especially when they can see the box under the tree. Oh, Mum! Oh, Dad! Couldn't we just open it today? And that's what Paul's talking about in verses 2 and 4, isn't it? He says, couldn't we just have it now? We groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. We're waiting for what is mortal, all the brokenness of this world to be swallowed up by life. Paul changes the picture here, doesn't he? Instead of a tent being swapped for a house, he, he talks about clothes that we wear being covered over by greater and better clothing in verses 3 and 4. That's what happens when a Christian receives their resurrected body. God recreates our bodies, but better. And so we have to ask, what about the bit in between? We know what we've got now. We know what will be in heaven And after the resurrection. But but what about in between? What about between when we die and when Christ raises the dead on the last day? Well, Paul talks about it here. But there are other options we have to consider too. Some people say that our souls sleep. uh, That when we die, we become unconscious until the resurrection. But that idea has no support in the scriptures and yet people who come and knock on your door or different Bible notes that you'll have might even promote that idea. In fact, Jesus' words to the thief on the cross disprove that. In Luke 23 verse 13, he says, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And don't let someone spin you a nice story about how the comma's in the wrong place. Jesus is making every word count as he nearly suffocates in his own fluids. He doesn't need to put in rhetorical flourishes like, I am telling you today that sometime, and I'm not telling you when, you'll be in heaven. No, he's indicating today is the time the thief will be on the cross, uh, from the cross will be in heaven. Because the thief's request was, when you come back, remember me. And Jesus says, no, not just then, today. And isn't that exactly what Jesus told the disciples one day before in the verse that John read to us from John 14, verse 3? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. That where I am, I and you may be which is the most literal way you can put it. Jesus isn't gathering up a bunch of people in comas to enjoy their company until the resurrection. He wants to be with believers when we die. And so as verse 8 says, when we die, we are at home with the Lord. So we have to ask again, what's that going to be like? Paul recognises that between the death of a believer and their resurrection at the last day will be unclothed, as verses 2 and 4 say. And we've seen that our present body is described as clothing, the resurrection body is clothing, and so while we wait to be clothed, we will be without bodies. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to come to this passage, in part to correct something I said on Easter Sunday Yes, you can be you without a body, but you won't be you without a body for all eternity. God's purpose has always been to have his people clothed again. In fact, that's the very purpose for which God created us, as verse 5 says. 
And that means it's guaranteed. It means that when you become a Christian, you receive that guarantee yourself. Because as verse 5 says, the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So if you have spiritual life given to you by the Holy Spirit, who lives in you, then you are guaranteed that you will live forever with the Lord. Is that you? Or do you want it to be you? See, the last truth that God wants to show us uh, is, uh, the last truth that God wants us to know uh, is the f- about the future life after death is that we can be certain of living the next life with the Lord. Now, when we turn from sin and rebellion to trust in Jesus for forgiveness and life, we have that guarantee. Uh, It'll make sense to fear death if all we do is focus on this life and the things we can see, if we're absorbed in the physical things. And so death will mean leaving all that behind, even our bodies for a time. But if you're a believer, that's not something to be worried about. Again, we've been told, don't lose heart in chapter 4. And we're told in verse 6, therefore, we're always confident. And know that as long as we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. And so instead of living by what we see, Christians live by faith. We have confidence in God to do what we can't see, as Hebrews 11 says. What we need to know about heaven. And the life to come is nothing about angels and harps and clouds and streets made out of gold. No, what we need to know is verse 8. We're confident, I say, and we prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So brothers and sisters, here and now, we can be confident as we look forward to being there then because Jesus is there and he'll come to take us to be with him. Now, it doesn't mean Christians should all just want to die and not care about this world. But if we live by faith, there is nothing we can see or have or do here on earth that is more important than being with Jesus. Are you looking forward to that? Do you long for what God has truly made you for? Do you feel that this life surely can't be everything, that there's something missing in it? Do you look forward to being with Jesus? Or don't you really belong to him? See, God has made believers to live with him forever. But what difference does it make to how we live now? Well, Paul sums it all up for us, doesn't he, in verses 9 and 10. He says, if you're going to live with him, then live to please him now. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due to us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. See, the judgment is coming. Every person who has ever lived, good or bad, living or dead, believers or unbelievers, will be called to account by Jesus Christ. And if you have turned from your rebellion and sin, and you trust in Jesus to save you and to give you eternal life, and his spirit dwells in you, then you don't have to fear being condemned on that day. Romans 8 verse 1 gives us the verdict already. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so that judgment is not to determine will you be saved in the end or not, if you believe now. But you do have to expect that day. And you do have to live knowing you'll be responsible for how you live this life because we will receive what is due to us for the things done in the body, 
It won't change whether we're saved, but it will determine our rewards in heaven. So if Jesus has saved you at the cost of his life, wouldn't you want to give him your life now? It's very easy to say yes, isn't it? It's easy to say, oh, of course. But are our hearts in it? We can find out very easily. Just ask yourself, now or this afternoon, what are you looking forward to? But what's the next big thing that you're excited about? Is it your retirement? Is it a holiday somewhere? Is it a new car? Is it work, a job, something, a party coming up? Is it next weekend? Or is it the resurrection and being with Jesus forever? Do we really desire to be with Christ? Do we actually think that that is better than anything by far? C.S. Lewis wrote, If we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures, falling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what's meant by the offer of a holiday by the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Do you desire to be with Christ? Or something far less desirable. Then make it your goal to please him. Let's pray. Now, mighty God, you challenge not only our thoughts, but also the desires of our hearts. We find it, our God, so easy to attach importance and significance and value to the things that are just falling apart. Our own bodies and the things that we own and have and do. When you offer to us in the gospel, not only eternal life, but eternal life with you. Our God, we confess that so often we live by sight rather than by faith. And so we pray that you would give us confidence. Give us confidence that as you have raised the Lord Jesus, so you will also raise us with him. Give us confidence that although our earthly bodies are wasting away on the outside, that Your spirit, the deposit you've given us, is renewing us day by day on the inside. Give us confidence that as long as we're away from you, we have a home. But when we come to be with you, we will have a better home by far. So help us to live to please you, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.